VO2 max is probably the most talked about number when it comes to endurance performance, but a lot of people are a little bit unsure of what exactly VO2 max is. So today's video is breaking down everything you need to know about that magical number that everyone talks about in the endurance performance industry. Let's get into it. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel, everything science of endurance and sports science in general. Hopefully you're enjoying the video so far. And if you have, please hit the subscribe button uh, and the bell so you can be notified when more videos come out because they will be coming out more and more over the coming weeks and over the next little while. Today's video, as I said in the intro, is everything to do with VO2 max. So it's the number that gets most talked about when we are looking at endurance performance. And it's a number that everyone really sort of associates with elite athlete performance, really high VO2 max numbers. It's probably the most accessible now as well when we've got things like our Garmin watches and things like that that are telling us a VO2 max or an estimated VO2 max. So what I wanted to do today is break down everything you need to know about this this magical number or this, this I guess, pedestal number in endurance performance. Is it actually our best indicator of performance and everything else in between? So without any further ado, let's get into the definition of VO2 max, which overall is the maximum amount of, of, of oxygen that you can take in, transport, and utilize in one minute. So we're looking at three components here. We're looking at the ability of the body to take in air in the first place, extract the oxygen out of that air, uh, transport it through the body to where it needs to go, so mostly the muscles, but the brain, um, organs, etc., and then be able to actually use that oxygen to break down fuel and create energy through the aerobic glycolysis system in particular, which is a breakdown of carbohydrates using oxygen to give us energy and allow us to, to create some movement, but also through the aerobic lipolysis system, which is a breakdown of fats. So obviously we can use fats and carbs as fuels, which I might cover in a, in a video later date. It's all got to start with those three components, but it, it has to go through that process. We can't have a missing step in the system and still have a still have an oxygen consumption. There, there has to be all three systems working together in unison to be able to give us an, our end result. And if one step is missing or one step is slightly weaker, that's going to significantly impact the rest of the chain. So in terms of a respiratory system, obviously we have to get the air in first. And the way we do that is the air starts in the atmosphere out and around us. We breathe it in to start with. Um, inhale, get uh, air into the lungs in the first place. Now that air is made up of a whole bunch of things. At sea level, only 21% of the air we breathe in is oxygen. So the rest is gonna be hydrogen, nitrogen, carbon, um, a, a whole bunch of different gases. What, what we end up with is a very small portion of actual usable air. The whole total that comes in isn't necessarily use, usable. We're gonna breathe it in and then we're probably just gonna breathe it back out. So we then need to make sure that our transport mechanism is capable enough of extracting as much oxygen out of that 21% as we can to then move it to where it needs to go. That's the first part of the, really, the first key part of the process is, can we get the most out of the air that we have just breathed into our lungs? Step one is pretty crucial. If you can get as much air in total, it gives you the best possible chance to transport the oxygen out of that air. But step two and step three of the, the VO2 max equation are almost just as critical, even, even more so. So as we go through the process, the, the order of priority actually increases. And we have to extract that oxygen out of the air. Like I said, 21% at sea level is not a lot of oxygen. So we need to extract that into the bloodstream. So we first get what's called diffusion, where gases move from a, a, an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. That being in the, in the lungs, we have a high concentration of oxygen because we've just breathed in. In the bloodstream, we have a high concentration of carbon dioxide typically because that's what we've produced as a byproduct and we're trying to get rid of it. So what does that mean? In the lungs, high concentration of oxygen, low concentration of CO2 in the bloodstream, high concentration of CO2, low concentration of oxygen. So those gases are gonna move in opposite directions, essentially. They're gonna swap and exchange. And what we get from the lungs is we get oxygen moving into the bloodstream. That then allows us to pick up that oxygen via hemoglobin. So hemoglobin being a part of a red blood cell that's gonna bind the oxygen to it and then start to allow it to move around the body. So that's where we can send the red blood cells wherever we need to, whether that's the legs, the arms, um, through into uh, up to the brain for uh, oxygen to the brain, things like that that's gonna transport it to where it needs to go. So we, we've now hit a stage where we've taken in, we've transported as much as we can, now we actually have to use it. And typically where this usage stage is happening is the working muscle. And that's what I'm gonna use as my example today, because we do obviously need oxygen in the brain, we do need it to some of the vital organs, things like that we need to send blood to the, the lungs, to the heart, um, to, to keep some of the processes going. We obviously say send a little bit of blood to the stomach if we're taking on fuel partway through a race, things like that. I'm not gonna overcomplicate it with that though. And I mostly focus on oxygen going to the muscle and then being used. So we transport it through the bloodstream, comes from the lungs, it gets transported to the heart first of all, then gets pumped out the arteries. Arteries turn into smaller arteries, which are arterioles. Arterioles become capil capillaries eventually, so the smallest blood vessels. Those allow us to get a really good distribution of, of blood flow around the muscle. So we can send it to lots of lots of parts or lots of entries or doors, if you like, into the muscle, allow us to get the oxygen in and then we can start to process it and use it. This usage step 
is really, really critical because, as I said before, if we if we have a decent amount of air being taken in, if we can transport a reasonable amount, but then we can't use it and it's just getting to the muscle and then going, oh, I can't really do anything with it, I'm going to spit it back out, our oxygen consumption overall is going to be quite low. So our VO2 overall is going to be quite low. The usage part is probably the most critical. Order of priority is the highest priority being your usage, the middle priority being transport. The lowest priority probably is the, the breathing aspect and getting air into the lungs in the first place because it's relatively easy to do. The, the last part that does require a lot of specific adaptation. Um, genetics play a really significant role here as well. The, the more um, slow twitch fibers you have, the more mitochondria, um, size, surface area, density, etc. the more myoglobin, so the transporters, which I'll get into a second, are all going to determine your ability to actually use the oxygen at the end stage, which is the, the part that we need it for. If we can't use the oxygen effectively, then we're going to be having we're going to have a lower aerobic contribution, higher anaerobic contribution, and everybody we're going to fatigue a lot faster at the same intent. This usage part, oxygen comes through the bloodstream, gets to the muscle. We get this diffusion again, so high concentration of oxygen in the, in the bloodstream, in the arteries, in the arterioles, and the, and the capillaries. That gets diffused into the muscle where there's low concentration and we get the CO2 exchange like what happened at the lungs. When we when we get it through the capillaries to the muscle though, oxygen is then picked up within the muscle cell by myoglobin, so that's our transporter. Think of that as like when you walk into, like if we use the example of a, um, like a like a footy game, you go in the you go in the gates at the front. We got lots of gates to get lots of people in. There are all the capillaries trying to get oxygen into the muscle in the first place. Then you go to your section where you're sitting. Um, you, you've got the ushers at the end of it, each aisle telling you, all right, you're in row um, double A, which is ten rows up on to the right, and you're in seat six or, or and seven. Um, that's like the, the that usher there is like the myoglobin. It's transporting the oxygen to where it needs to go specifically. So it takes it from the bloodstream, for, or, or from the, the the cellular wall in the in the muscle cell, through into the mitochondria, which is like being in seat. And the more seats we have, the more people we have in the stadium, the more the the, the, the louder the crowd noise. If 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 that's an analogy you want to use, if we translate that to performance, the the more mitochondria we have, the the more oxygen we can actually use. In those in those mitochondria, the more aerobic pe- uh, um, output we can have, better usage of fuel from an aerobic perspective, less fatigue. We work harder and faster for longer because it's not going to be as fatigued. Really, we just want to have as many doors in, as many ushers as possible, and as many um, seats in the stands to be able to really use as much of the oxygen as we can. I, I guess in in summary, what we're looking at here is VO2 max is is really quite simply the maximum amount of oxygen we can take in, transport, and utilize. And it has to, in one minute, very critical that it's in one minute cycle. So it's aerobic power, the rate at which we can use oxygen. What we have to consider though, is it's three systems working together. We can't just focus on one or or two of the systems. We have to focus on our respiratory, our cardiovascular, so lungs, heart and the blood, and then also the muscular system in terms of the usage for the taking transport utilize to be able to have this process occur and, and make the most of that process. Once you understand that, then you can start applying the appropriate training techniques to improve some of those aspects of those processes or improve the individual systems a little bit better. You can work on things like being a bit more effective and efficient in terms of your breathing. You can work on um, uh, the, the cardiovascular adaptations from improving the amount of blood you can pump out per beat, so improving your stroke volume. We can do that via high intensity training. We can do that via long, slow training. It's just a slightly different take on the adaptation. We then start to work on how can we improve the mitochondrial density and get a really good stimulus of mitochondria there, typically from a high intensity session, but we can get it a bit from longer, slower if you're more of a beginner or intermediate athlete. Very, very simple to then program what we need to do to be able to improve. So overall, VO2 max isn't this big complex number. It's a very simple way um, of, of just understanding how the body gets oxygen into the system, transports it, then uses it. This is something that may surprise a lot of you. In terms of performance, it's not actually the number one indicator of endurance performance. If, and I say big if here, if the event is longer than typically sort of probably, I'm gonna say as a very general rule, 10 minutes and above, probably even less, probably really six to seven minutes and above in length. Go to max is, is going to be your best indicator. Anything over that, it really comes down to what percentage of VO2 max can you hold. And that's typically where we start looking at things like lactate threshold or anaerobic threshold, um, functional threshold. Any of those any of those words all essentially mean the same thing. That theoretical intensity you can hold for 45 to an hour becomes a hell of a lot more important in the performance equation because it's it's what whoever can hold the highest intensity for the longest period of time is going to win the, win the event in most endurance sports anyway. That's the way it's set up. If you can get to the line the fastest, that 
that's the ultimate goal. So this events where VO2 max is our number one indicator of performance. So we're talking things like a 1500 meter track runner, maybe up to 3000 on the track, um, 800 sort of a mix between the anaerobic systems and the aerobic, but 1500 is a really good example, really high VO2 max ability to use oxygen very, very quickly at a very high intensity is going to be a key to minimizing how much fatigue you accumulate early in the race so you can push harder at the end don't get me wrong the really elite endurance athletes who go for longer than 10 20 minutes at a time in most endurance sports you're out there for hours have very high vo2 maxes up in the sort of 70s and the 80s even in the 90s sort of range but it's the type of thing that there's a number of other factors that need to come into it and i'm going to do a video in the coming weeks on the determinants of endurance performance and what the key principles are that are that are going to be your key indicators of endurance performance overall but it's really critical to understand that VO2 max is is, a, is an interesting number. It's an interesting benchmark of where your overall aerobic system is. It's useful for the shorter events in terms of predicting performance, but for predicting performance and determining performance in longer duration events, it's not the number one predictor. It is an indication, but it's not our best predictor of performance. That's a very clear distinguish, uh, distinguishing factor we need to make. Hopefully you've enjoyed this video and got a little bit out of it in terms of understanding VO2 max a little bit better. Any questions, leave some comments down below. Happy to answer them. Uh, it can be a bit of a tricky concept, but like I said, if you break it down to that take in, transport, utilize steps, you can start to actually understand a little bit more in depth of the physiology behind it in terms of the systems involved and the process of oxygen coming into the body and actually being used. There's a number in the endurance industry that does get talked about a lot. So it's really critical as many people as possible can understand what it actually means. So when we do talk about it, we've got a bit more context to what we're saying. Again, hopefully you enjoyed the video. Please hit the subscribe button and the bell to get notified uh, for any future videos coming. Will be a few coming, like I said, on determinants of endurance performance and, and a lot more. So if you are interested, please hit subscribe and the bell and we'll see you in the next video.